Good morning, including to those who are listening afterwards online or podcast or YouTube or website. Um, this is David. David is sharing with us this morning from the Word. And as I said before, David's the General Secretary in WA, also a real man of God and of prayer. And it's great to have you here, David. May I pray for you? Father, thank you for this morning that we have together to hear from your word. We pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us this morning. We pray you'd take what David has prepared, the words that you have put on his heart, and bring them alive for us that we may hear um, the voice of your Holy Spirit um, whispering to us to shape us, to transform us, to guide us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, can you hear me? Right. Morning again, in case you didn't hear me earlier. Um, It's great to be with you this morning. About an hour ago, as I was about to say, uh, Luke was praying with uh, all of those who were organizing the service, and he said, uh, and Lord, we pray that you would be with us for the next hour or so. So we're in the also time uh, of this uh, this session. Um, So so I hope your services aren't aren't only 60 minutes long. (laughs) Because otherwise, I'm in trouble. <laughs> anyway, it's great. It is great to be here, and we're going to uh, to start with um, with the scripture readings. Amy is going to read for us. Um, so let's let's go. <clears throat> Mark chapter twelve, verse thirty-five to forty. Later, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, he asked. Why do the teachers of religious law claim that the Messiah is the son of David? For David himself, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, The Lord said to my my Lord, Sit in the place of honour at at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David himself called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? The large crowd listened to him with great delight. Jesus also taught, beware of these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And how they love the seats of honour in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Yet, they shamelessly cheat windows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be more severely punished. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, the poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for sharing that that with us. Um, I'm really talking about three parts to um, that text, and there are three parts to it, and, and I've called them three imperatives of the Christian life which fit in with uh, your theme, which is like Jesus. Uh, So this is how we might live like like Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, first before we begin to add some credibility to what I say. Erin, if we can go to the next slide. I don't know what you're seeing there. This is all the... I love the Lord with all my heart. This is my description of myself. With all my heart, with all my understanding, and with all my strength. And I love my neighbor as much as I love myself. Well, that's all I'm going to tell you about me, because uh, I don't really want to say anything more than that, and I hope that that's also true for you. Uh, And that's exactly what Luke was sharing with you last week in the same theme about being like Jesus. Now, much as I like to speak and preach, uh, I always find it really difficult to break into an existing 
conversation, particularly one that's been going on for 29 weeks already, uh, as Luke has preached through the series. You've been on this journey through Mark's gospel, or Mark's account of the good news about Jesus. Uh, To a significant extent, Luke has been on one side of that conversation, and you have been on the other. You've not always had the opportunity to respond verbally, perhaps, uh, to Luke's Luke's words uh, as he brought them to you, but you've responded in your mind, as we always do, as we hear sermons and as we hear people, people speaking. And perhaps, hopefully, you've also applied them in your life. I've not been part of that conversation, but praise God for video cameras and things uh, and for the internet. So I was able to catch up on some of these sermons on, on, the, uh, your, on your website to find out where you've been and where, where you're going. Um, And so I have got some sense of what what has been going on, and this is really an appropriate thing for us to be looking at uh, today. Uh, These three, it's one text, but there's three parts to it, and they're really important for us to see that. From halfway through Mark's gospel, or halfway through Mark 11, on our Lord's final journey into Jerusalem, because that's where we are in this context, um, that journey was to take Jesus to the cross. Mark presents to us a whole series of conversations between Jesus and a representative body of people, those closest to him, um, those who are unsure about him but are trying to find out something about Jesus, and those who are vehemently opposed to Jesus. They are all the people that are there uh, in this conversation. It has been suggested that these conversations that were dealt with last week and this week uh, took place on the Tuesday of Holy Week, which is sometimes called the Day of Questions. And as Luke so aptly uh, showed last week, these questions really summarize everything about the purpose of Jesus' mission uh, to us. He came so that we could build a relationship with God. Listen to that, because it's important for the whole theme of where we're going. He came so that we could build a relationship with God. Jesus came to remove everything that could prevent that relationship from forming. But the truth is, that's not the end of the story. Even in Jesus' life, this is still only Tuesday of Holy Week. The triumphant ride into Jerusalem was not the end. The day of questions was not the end. There is still the intimacy of the Last Supper. There's still the personal struggle and surrender in Gethsemane. There's still the trial to come. There's still the cross and ultimately the resurrection, which begins to put everything into perspective. The relationship with God didn't suddenly happen because Jesus came to us. The relationship with God needs also for there to be some action from us, some kind of a response, just as we have in a conversation. And so the text gives us three considerations. We should... The first is the question about who Jesus is. That's verse 35 to 37 of the text we had today. The question about who Jesus is. The second is a warning about wrong motives. That's the, the verse 38 to verse 40 about those who go around in long robes. And then there's the challenge to sacrificial living from verse 40 to 44, which is about the widow and the giving of everything she had to live on uh, into the temple treasury. Those three parts, in my view, show us specifically how we can address those things in our lives, your life and mine, uh, about how we can prevent our relationship or deal with the things that could prevent our relationship with God from forming and thus inhibit our faith lives and keep us in the struggle of the world. Do you like to struggle in the world? Some of you seem to. (laughs) Do you like to struggle in the world? Jesus came with a different vision for us. He came with a different picture for us. He came to bring us new life. He came to bring a new beginning. And part of that new beginning, that new hope that we have, comes out of the way in which he came and the way in which he addressed himself to us and the way in which he expects us to respond to his coming amongst us. And so um, when Jesus has that, those con- that conversation, the three that we're dealing with today, 
he's not talking to the people who are opposed to him. He's dealing only with those who, have, who are closest to him and those who want to follow him. So that's you. He's writing to you. He's speaking to you through the words of Mark. And the disciples and those others who are there to learn are keen to hear what Jesus has to say. And Jesus is keen to teach them. There's just a few days left before he's crucified. The matter is urgent. The statements that he gives are imperatives for us if we want to walk in the Jesus way. And so the first one is the question about who Jesus is. The first imperative is that we acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah come from God to draw us back by removing or showing us how to remove everything that could prevent that relationship from, from happening. That was what Luke was dealing with last week. And so Jesus asks this question. Why do the teachers of the law say that, Jesus, that the Messiah is the son of David? The Jewish nation were, of course, expecting the Messiah to be the son of David. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem and you've ever been to David's tomb, which is probably not his tomb anyway, um, but there's a great big um, sarcophagus that is there and there's always a rabbi sitting there next to it and he's always praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time, praying for the Messiah to come. And yet the Messiah has come. And so Jesus asks this question. And it's a leading question which brings Jesus to the point where he can now quote from Psalm 110, saying, uh, when David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. So says Jesus, if David calls the Messiah Lord, or Adonai, in the Hebrew version in the Old Testament, um, in Psalm 110, or Kurios in the, in the Greek, uh, as it is used and quoted in Mark's Gospel, how then can the Messiah be his son? And the supposedly ignorant crowd, I love this little bit, the supposedly ignorant crowd were delighted with this observation. They were delighted with the observation because it says something about the wisdom of common sense. Yeah, these ordinary people who the scribes and Pharisees look down upon as ignoramuses, they got it. They got it. They understood that the Messiah would come from, would come from the line of David but would not be the son, the son of David. There was so much religiosity in the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees that they had missed this fairly obvious point. The common crowd, however, the ignoramuses, had worked this all out for themselves. Later in writing to the church in Rome, uh, Paul says to them, Jesus is the Son of God. As to his earthly life, he was a descendant of David. But through the Spirit, he is the Son of God, revealed in power through his resurrection from the dead. As followers of Christ, you and I, our first imperative in addressing these things in, in our lives which could prevent our relationship with God from forming, is to acknowledge that Jesus is Messiah and Lord. Now you might say, well, that's obvious, David. That's why we're here. Surely, that's the reason why we have come. That's true. It is obvious. But truth be known, even followers of Christ struggle with other lords and other idols in their life. In the early days of the church, it was the thing to say, Jesus is Lord. Because you refuse to bow to Caesar, you refuse to accept other things in your life. But in our modern day life, it is so easy for us to be drawn away to other idols and to other, other lords of our life that dominate us, that describe our life, which lead our life more than what it does in our following of Jesus. And that's the subject of our next two imperatives. So the second one is a warning about wrong motives. How easy it is, isn't it, for us to live out our lives with wrong motives. 
And this perhaps particularly amongst the ordained clergy. It's not just the robes and the dog collars or the titles, reverend, venerable, his eminence, his excellency, and all of those other fancy titles that often are given to those who are ordained. But that's just stuff, isn't it? That's just stuff. And sometimes it can be really, really helpful in getting a fast track into hospitals, even, even in this day, day and age. <laughs> and sometimes it's helpful to wear a dog collar to go and talk to somebody about giving some money uh, to some philanthropic institution. It can also be helpful in opening faith conversations with the faithless. When I was ordained many, many years ago, in, back in South Africa, I was a Presbyterian in those days, uh, and uh, my father gave me a gift of a black cassock, which is what Presbyterians wore, this heavy black cassock and a heavy black preaching gown. Why we would wear this in Africa, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, but anyway, that's what, that's what they did. And, um, uh, and I never wore it except for funerals and weddings. Why? Because that's often where the faithless people come. And it gives an opportunity to say, ah, oh, there's the guy. Oh, and it, you, it opens doors to be, begin to talk about faith. But I certainly wouldn't wear it to come and preach to you guys this morning. <laughs> You'd probably think I was pretty weird <laughs> if I was to arrive here, especially on this hot day, even with your aircon, uh, with my thick black cassock. James, in chapter 2 of his little letter, warns us about giving more respect to the one with the gold ring and dressed in fine clothes than to the poor man who is dressed in filthy old rags. You see, any Christ follower who attempts to put himself or herself above others in any situation, whether in a Christian gathering or not, fails the test of Christian humility. In my last congregation in South Africa, one of our core values was based on John chapter 13 and verse 15. They are the words of Jesus that he speaks to his disciples just after he has washed their feet. And he says to them, I have set you an example that you should do to others as I have done to you. I have become a servant to you. I want you to be a servant to those who need to be my servants too. And it became so much of our ethos in that, in that congregation that when we moved into our new building, because we'd kind of outgrown the little place where we were, um, the cornerstone that was put into the wall at the door of the church gave no tribute to those who had donated in a short period of just a little under three months millions of dollars in order to pay off the debt on this building. And I'm going to talk about debt on buildings in a little while. Those people who had given millions of dollars to pay off the debt on this building in three months it was an interesting story because the elders said to me, David, we, don't believe we, had, we had to take out a mortgage in order to pay for the building to be done. Um, after we moved in, the elders came to me and said, David, we don't believe that we should have any debt. That was really hard for us. I said, what do you expect us to do? So they said, you should ask the congregation. So with trembling hands, I stood in front of the congregation and I said, the elders have said we should not have any debt. Our debt is X millions. Could you please make a contribution? In three months, the congregation paid all the money that was needed to pay off the debt. And yet, when it came to putting in the cornerstone of the church, these are the words that they wanted put on the stone to the church. Not glory to God or glory to all those people who had given millions, but instead they chose a verse from Psalm 115, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to you be the glory for your love and faithfulness. Because it all comes from God. It's all from God. So, my friends, what is 
the motive of your faith? What is the motive of your faith? What is the motive of your religiosity? What brings you to church? What causes you to be a follower of Jesus? Is it to set you apart from others, or is it to serve others? Why do you do this? Why do you follow Jesus? Are you looking for pie in the sky when you die? What is the reason why you have faith in Jesus? John Wesley was driven by this mantra, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And that's what the Methodist Church was built on. It was built on that statement. And Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, in Corinthians chapter 9, says, To the Jews I will become like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law I will become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. To those not having the law, I will become like one who does not have the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those who have no law. To the weak, I will become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means possible, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. The motivation was to do things or take on attitudes in order that in serving others, they may be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever we do, however we say it, as Wesley said, let it be for the sake of the gospel. So the first imperative that I I spoke about is to acknowledge Jesus as Messiah and Lord. The second is to serve others rather than self for the sake of the gospel. And the third imperative is to recognize the challenge of sacrifice. I think there's a slide that comes up there. That's, there we go. The story of the widow and her two copper coins is a well-known story and often used to illustrate that real giving, real giving, is measured not by how much you give, but by how much you have left after you have given. It is sometimes unwisely, in my opinion, used to encourage congregations to give more money. I don't think that's the intent of it. Instead, I believe we should see this as a story of sacrifice. It is a story of sacrifice. And our faith story is all about sacrifice. As I indicated earlier, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem was not the end. There was still pain and death to come before there was resurrection. So God in Jesus left the realms of glory to enter into creation. He took the frailty of human flesh. He suffered and he died with one purpose in mind. One purpose in mind. To restore our brokenness and to bring us back into a relationship with him. That's why Jesus came. God gave love and waits for our love to be revealed. And love is not love until it is first made vulnerable and then voluntarily offered and taken up. Jesus made himself vulnerable. He voluntarily gave everything. God has shown his love. Our love, your love and my love, will only be truly revealed when we have ourselves become vulnerable. And we are a very protective species. We protect ourselves at every point from the words of others, from the way in how others think about us. But we are called to be vulnerable because you cannot have love without being vulnerable. We can't cling to some worldly life boy. But we need to trust in the way which is Christ 
and we need to be prepared to sacrifice even ourselves for the sake of the gospel. We heard about those 22 people in Afghanistan. What have they done? They gave themselves. Is it a tough call to do this? Of course it is. Of course it's a tough call. And we would not be here today. You know, it's, it's great to come into this beautiful building, to drive down these beautiful streets, to gather together as the community of God. But we would not be here today were it not for those who in centuries past had made the sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. Not just of money, but of their lives, their careers, their potential worldly gains, they gave everything in order that the church might be here, in order that Billabong Church might be here today. I often wonder what happened to that widow when she gave her two small copper coins. By giving those coins out of her poverty, Jesus says she gave everything she had to live on. Isn't that profound? That's all she had to live on. And she gave it away. She gave it away. That's the challenge, my friends, of sacrifice for us also. And it's really hard in our material world in this lucky country of Australia. It's really hard. So where have we come to today? Well, last week we discovered through Luke that Jesus came in order that we might build a relationship with God. And he came to remove everything that could prevent that relationship from forming. And today we have heard of three imperatives which can ensure that this all happens for us, for our families, for our friends, and for the world. One, we must acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, who came to us with a divine purpose. Second, we need to be aware of the motives that drive us. Are we serving others rather than ourselves for the sake of the gospel? And third, we should recognize the challenge of sacrifice, for it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, thanks to Francis of Assisi. Finally, and of course you know with all preachers, when they say finally, that's not the end. <laughs> but we're getting there, slowly. Finally, I can only tell you these things. But you need to put them into action. You need to take that to yourself. Jesus is my Lord. My motives are for the sake of the gospel. And I'm prepared to face the challenge of whatever sacrifice I need to make in order to live for Christ and to bring others into that saving grace that I have found for myself. That's your choice. You can choose to do that, or you can choose not to do that. And then you need to ask yourself, what are your motives? Why are you doing that? So, to close, so we're now at the close, okay? <laughs> to close, let me tell you a little bit about your ex-loan that you had, which Luke spoke about this morning. There are some in the church, in the investment committee particularly, who believe the very things that I have spoken about today. It's really important for you to understand that. These three things that I've spoken about. Jesus is Lord. What are our motives? How do we make the sacrifice? They believe that the synod and the presbytery should do what they can to remove anything that stands in the way of the mission of the church. And with this conviction, they wrote off your loan of $2.4 million dollars. That's a lot of money. That's going to hurt the future income streams of the Synod, which depends entirely on the earnings of investments. We don't have any other income. 
other than the investments, which incidentally are the gifts of bygone generations who have made gifts to the church and have said, I'm going on to be with Jesus and I have X dollars left. I want to give that or some of that, which I don't give to my family, to the church. And out of that, the church has built up a, an amount of money from which it earns an interest. Now, it's taken $2.4 million, $2 million of that capital, and it said, Billabong, we believe that your mission would be freed if you no longer had this debt. Is that good news? Yes. Absolutely, it is good news. But there's another part to that, because this is, you see, we can get the stuff, but we also need to act. They trust those people who decided to write off that debt are trusting that you, the people of this congregation, will take that gift and use your new debtless freedom to multiply for the kingdom of God. Just as each Christian, freed of the burden of sin, can go out and make disciples. Now, there's a lot of chicanery that happened in writing off the debt, because the property is already owned by the church, by the synod. It's not owned by the billabong, it's already owned by the church. So that property is now coming back to the church. Well, actually, it was already in the church, um, so how does this work? Well, we've got to do all the accounting stuff. So if we're going to write off $2.4 million, we've got to take something else in exchange uh, into the books. So we brought the land back into the books of the investment fund. And sometime in the future, that will be developed. And we're saying to this congregation, we want you to look after that land. We want you to ensure that it's trimmed, it's mowed, that the fences, when they're broken, are fixed, that you pay the rates. Well, fortunately, it's the church, so we don't pay any rates anyway. Um, but if there's anything to pay, I don't think that it's going to cost more than $10,000 a year to, to look after that, that property. And if you have an idea of how that property can be used in the future, God bless you. Do it. Do it. Make it happen, because that's what it is. There are some ideas. The Synod itself might decide to have some ideas with regard to that property, but if you have an idea, let's do it. So remember what I said to you? What are the three points? I'm just testing to see if you were actually listening. <laughs> right, first one. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> okay. Second one. Motives, right? Have the right motives. What's the third one? Sacrifice. There we go. God bless you. I'm going to pray a prayer uh, now with you. And this is a prayer that I posted this morning on my Facebook page. If anybody want to follow me on Facebook, you'll get a prayer every day. You might get some pictures of my family and so on as well. But basically, I've post, I'm just there to post a, face, a prayer every day. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for your church, which you called into being through your Son. Your desire has always been that we should be a blessing to all people everywhere. And so we ask today that by your Holy Spirit, your church may be renewed on this new day and be empowered for the task for which you gave it life. May we be ready for any sacrifice, any action, any declaration that will clearly demonstrate faith, hope, and love to our neighbors, our family members, our friends, our co-workers and our fellow travelers. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Luke. I'll hand back to you. <laughs>